Welcome to episode two of the Investor's Guide to Battery Materials. This is part of a regular series providing both private and professional investors with all the information that they're likely to need in order to help them invest in the world of battery materials. In this episode, I'm going to talk about how batteries work and the actual uses of the materials in the battery. In the battery space, we happily drop words like anode and cathode quite regularly, but we often don't talk about what they're made of and how the materials actually help batteries to work. Before we start, i just give a quick introduction. My name is Matt Fernley, and I'm Managing Director of Battery Materials Review. I've been an equity analyst specializing in the mining and basic materials sector for over 20 years. During that time, I've been a broker as well as an investor, both professional and private, and I've written a number of primers on various aspects of the mining sector to help explain them to investors. I started Battery Materials Review a few years ago as a one-stop shop for everything investors and companies would need to know about what's going on in the wider battery and battery materials sector. I'd also like to specifically thank this edition's sponsor, which is Cornish Lithium. Cornish Lithium is an innovative exploration and development company focused on the environmentally sustainable extraction of lithium from geothermal waters and hard rock sources in Cornwall in the United Kingdom. The company has secured mineral rights over a large area and uses modern digital technology to combine large historical and contemporary data sets, allowing reinterpretation of the technology metals potential. It is a private British company headquartered in Cornwall and enjoys a strong relationship with both local and national government. So first of all, here's a list of the materials that you might find in the battery. Most people who've invested in the mining industry before have probably come across things like copper, zinc, aluminium and nickel previously. But you might very well not have come across things like spodumene concentrate, manganese or HPA. So in this edition, I'm going to talk about how batteries work, and then I'm going to explain how these different materials fit into batteries. Okay, I want to discuss lithium ion batteries first, because even though there are other battery chemistries around, lithium ion looks like it's going to be, if you'll excuse the absolutely horrific pun, the engine of the upcoming electric vehicle event. So to understand this chemistry, I need to talk about lithium metal and its properties first. If you think back to your school chemistry lessons, lithium is the third element in the periodic table with an atomic number of three. Lithium's position in the periodic table, which is determined by its atomic structure, is vital to its use in batteries. And here's why. If you go back to those old chemistry lessons, the atomic number is the number of protons or positively charged particles in the nucleus. Lithium has three, and it also has four neutrons as well, but we won't go into those in any detail. To balance that out, lithium also has three electrons, which are negatively charged. Now, two of those electrons are in an outer ring or orbit close to the nucleus, while the other is further out in another ring. But lithium only has a small nucleus with three protons and four neutrons, compared to a metal like copper, for instance, which has 29 protons and 35 neutrons. And from that, you can probably understand that copper's mass is much larger, and as such, it exerts a greater pull on its orbiting electrons. The inner ring of electrons in lithium is pretty stable, but the outer one is not, and that's what makes lithium such a reactive metal. It's possible to separate the outer electron from the nucleus of the lithium. Now, the electron holds a negative charge, so when it splits off, it leaves a net positively charged lithium particle, which we call an ion, as well as the separate negatively charged electron. And this is the basis for the reaction which happens in a lithium ion battery cell. So let's talk about the mechanics of a battery cell then. There are four major components, the anode, which is the negative terminal of the cell, the cathode, which is the positive terminal, the electrolyte solution, which allows positively and negatively charged particles to flow between the anode and cathode, and the separator, which makes sure that only the right particles pass through. These are then linked by a circuit, which can either be charged or discharged. As we discussed, in a lithium ion cell, we have negatively charged electrons, and positively charged lithium ions, which initially reside in the cathode. The flow of electrons is, in its purest form, electricity. 
The lithium ion cell therefore works by splitting lithium atoms into lithium ions and electrons, which flow between the positive and negative terminals. The electrons flow around the circuit while the ions cross between the negative and positive terminals through the separator. When the cell is being charged, it works like this. And when it's being discharged, it works like this. So let's talk about the materials that go together to make a lithium ion cell. In a lithium ion battery, the cathode generally consists of lithium and metal oxides. When lithium is combined with other metal oxides, it is substantially more stable than it is on its own. There are any one of a number of formulations using different metals. These are often known as chemistries. Common chemistries for lithium iron include lithium cobalt oxide, known as LCO, lithium iron phosphate, known as LFP, nickel cobalt manganese, known as NCM, and nickel cobalt aluminium, known as NCA. For the anode, we generally use graphite. This is because graphite can form a layered structure and lithium ions can be stored easily between the layers. It is increasingly more common to add small amounts of silicon to improve the properties of graphite in electric vehicle batteries. Some companies are also using lithium titanate or LTO anodes, and some are also looking at using lithium metal. The electrolyte can be any one of a number of complex compounds, which often also contain lithium. Some companies are also investigating the use of ceramic electrolytes. Separators vary according to the type of battery. For lithium ion batteries, they may be made of polyethylene and polypropylene films, and often now have a ceramic coating as well. One of the fastest growing of these coatings is high purity alumina or HPA. Just to flag that from a materials demand standpoint, it is the cathode and anode that are the bulk of the weight of the cell. To put a scale on what we're talking about, the separator and electrolyte together make up only around 3% of the cell content in a lithium ion battery. So you have recognized many of the materials that I flagged earlier on in the presentation in this table. But there are two other materials that can be a substantial part of the mass of a lithium ion cell that I haven't mentioned here. Those materials are copper and aluminium, and they're actually used as current collectors to distribute the current flowing in or out of the electrode. In a cell, you'll find the cathode and anode layered on top of a thin foil of these metals. Now, you may have noticed that I quite assiduously used the word cell over the past few slides, whereas I spoke about batteries earlier. That's because in a pure definition, batteries and cells are not the same things. A battery, particularly in an electric vehicle or stationary storage context, is actually a number of cells connected together. So for instance, the Tesla Model 3's battery actually contains nearly 3,000 individual cells within it. And this differentiation is really important when we talk about the materials used in a battery rather than the materials used in a cell. I just need to mention here that there are different types of cells. In fact, there are three major different types of cells used in lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicle and stationary storage applications. The type of cell used can have quite substantial implications on the amount of material needed in a battery. First up, we have the cylindrical cell, as championed by Tesla in most of its vehicles. This is a small cell, and as I mentioned earlier, you need lots of cells to make a battery. The second type of cell to talk about is the prismatic cell. This is used by electric vehicles like the Nissan Leaf and BMW i3. It can be scaled to a bigger size, meaning fewer cells are needed to make a battery. The third type of cell commonly used in EVs is the pouch cell. This is used in electric vehicles like the Jaguar I-Pace and the Hyundai Kona, and will be a key component of General Motors' forthcoming Ultium battery architecture. Again, it can be made on a larger scale than cylindrical cells. A discussion of the relative attributes of the different types of cells is outside the scope of this presentation topic, but I may very well cover it at a later date. Because of the amount of cells needed to make an electric vehicle or a stationary storage product, 
cells are often grouped together in what we call modules. Modules are then grouped together to make a battery. The example on this slide shows a battery pack made of prismatic cells. Now, a battery pack doesn't only contain cells. Cells are packaged into modules, and there are packaging between them, and then modules are further packaged into the overall battery pack. Battery packs used in electric vehicles today have steel and aluminium housings to protect them from damage, cooling systems to, to prevent overheating and fires, and an overall battery management system to run the battery, as well as a fair amount of wiring and connectors. So in terms of materials usage, the raw materials which make up the cells may be only a fraction of the weight of the overall battery pack, which may contain significant additional amounts of copper, aluminium, and steel. This picture shows how the battery pack fits within an electric car. So that's really all I wanted to say about lithium-ion batteries, but you'll remember from the list of materials that I included at the beginning of the presentation that there are a number of those materials that I haven't mentioned. And this is because not all rechargeable batteries used today are based on the lithium-ion chemistry. It's certainly fair to say that lithium-ion is the battery of choice for electric vehicles, and it's also currently the battery of choice for stationary storage applications. However, that might not always be the case, and there are a number of battery types based on other chemistries that are looking to challenge lithium-ion, particularly in stationary applications. Now, this is a whole other topic, and I plan to cover it in more detail during a later webinar, but I wanted to flag that there are such battery types as flow batteries, which use vanadium or chromium as their electrolyte, and also batteries which use a zinc electrolyte, and even some which use an organic electrolyte and many other types which are looking to challenge lithium-ion in stationary storage applications. While it's quite early days for these batteries in terms of volume, there is a fair amount of excitement about their potential in some circles. So just to come back to the list of materials that I showed at the beginning of the presentation, and you'll notice that they were color-coded. So the light purple text represented materials used to manufacture cathodes for lithium-ion batteries. The pink purple text was for materials used for lithium-ion anodes, the blue for separators and current connectors, and the green for competing battery technologies. Aluminium gets two colors because of its use both as a cathode material in NCA batteries, and also its use as a current collector in most lithium-ion batteries. So thanks very much for listening to this presentation. If you want more information, you can listen to our Recharge podcast at the address below, or you can subscribe to our monthly journal at www.batterymaterialsreview.com, or you can tune in to more of our Investor's Guide series via our YouTube page. If there are any topics that you'd like me to discuss in the future, please leave a comment on the YouTube page or drop me a line via the Contact Us section on the Battery Materials Review website. I'm Matt Fernley, editor of Battery Materials Review, and goodbye for now.